Uh, part of his philosophy is that we combine uh, social sciences with, um, and humanities with the sciences. And part of what he wants, wanted to accomplish with this academy was to um, have individuals think for themselves rather than to learn rote from um, their, their elders. And so this is uh, an appropriate place for this conversation to be taking place. And here we go. Okay. Now I rebooted, so it's going to take a minute. Um, I started out, uh, I am what I believe Diego referred to as a diverse agent. Um, I come from another field here. Uh, came out of robotics and uh, SciTech policy. But I'm very interested in what's going on here, and I th I'm going to try to speak to you in language that I hope uh, we can translate, as Diego was saying, part of the process of bringing in other fields of thought is understanding the lingo that's used. For instance, um, uh, Victoris, or uh, no, actually Weaver, um, spoke of, am I still not getting a, okay. Is our tech, I don't know why this isn't working. We had this all working before. Yeah. It normally comes up automatically, so. Oh, good. Okay, good. All right. So, um, uh, Weaver brought up the term of uh, intensity, and I call that term disparity. And disparity is a driving force in everything, as, and who cares, right? Okay. Um, disparity is a driving force in everything, as Weaver pointed out, we, in, in our uh, electromagnetic networks, uh, chemistry, um, our economic systems, Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Now let's move along. Okay. And without disparity, of course, our hearts would not even beat. Now, in people, um, we have a difference engine called the anterior cingulate cortex. And this is where we look at our um, conceptions of what we'd like to be doing, whether it's planning or desires and so forth, and then uh, the actual current state. And then the difference, the disparity, of course, is what drives us to action. Equilibrium, as Weaver was talking about, is always a fleeting thing. Um, we a good example of how this happens in economics and relates to the peer-to-peer -peer economy that Diego was discussing is that we start out with Airbnb and on the short term, Airbnb lets an individual purchase a home of greater value or to monetize the extra space within their home and uh, it actually increases the size uh, or the amount of housing on the market. Okay. But over the longer term, what happens is that value falls into the price. And so the price of housing actually goes up. Um, mortgage lending agents may actually even incorporate that into the calculation that they use to determine how big a loan you get. And then the landlord who's looking over here he says, well, I'm renting to this guy and he's subletting and he's getting an extra thousand a month, forget that. I'm gonna break this apartment into two and short-term lease it all myself, okay? So what happens over longer term is that your, your long-term uh, rental supply actually contracts, your short-term supply increases and you can see that the impact is not what the short-term impact was. Oh, well, there you go. Then we've got the taxes too. Okay, go on. Um, so we don't want too much disparity. We can't get stability. However, economic prosperity surges with a more egalitarian 
curve, and obviously we would prefer not to have something uh, dramatic like that. So right now, the situation is we've got negative externalities are um, loaded onto the poor. They're the ones who have to live next to the nuclear power plants. They're the ones who get most of the pollution, most of the trash, and so forth. Um, we, we think we're, going, we're heading f toward a free society that transaction costs are heading to zero. Um, however, prices do not follow, partly because you've got fixed costs on any kind of hardware and so forth, and even in a, a 3D printing kind of situation, you're still going to have raw materials costs and, and, and logistical costs and so forth. So on, on um, material goods, um, you're still not going to have zero pricing, but even on software and things that actually can move towards zero pricing, the difficulty is that you don't have a um, free, free transaction system. The credit card companies, um, and I don't know how this works in Europe, so it may be different there, but in the United States, uh, the credit card companies have minimum merchant fees. And so uh, y your minimum merchant fee may be based on as much as $5. So obviously, microcommerce uh, is impossible when you have those kinds of transaction fees on top of what's happening. Um, and the, odd, the thing is, it's going in the wrong direction. Everybody thought Apple was going to bring out Square and uh, the transaction cost was going to disappear, but it turned out the other way. Apple loaded another 5%, I think, on top of the, of the transaction costs that the credit card companies are. So now you're paying over 10% uh, on an on a Apple charge. Um, then the referral system, the problem with refer referral system, Diego, is that you've got a lag time. So the first in people, um, uh, uh, Uber, okay? So Uber builds up a reputation on the people that are using it but then that creates a huge market barrier for next in. So first in, um, because there's a lag time to build up those references and referrals and brand imaging, trust. There's a lag time to build up trust. So the first in gain advantage and it's very, very hard. So you end up with an oligopoly, which is why online, look at what we've got. We've got Amazon, we've got Uber, and it's very hard for anybody to catch up. So um, that has to do with advantage, okay. So technically, narrowly, I could help all these things. Um, we could uh, use Nate Soar's uh, techniques that he, I think he talked about yesterday or the day before, um, and you know, run billions of experimental runs and optimize our p policies. Uh, we could do microcurrencies and contracts. Um, we could have the IoT out there looking at externalities and trying to set actual pricing for them to monetize the pollution and so forth that's coming out and say, hey, look guys, this is how much uh, it costs to get rid of an apple and put it into your, pack, into your pricing. Um, and then we could just in general, if you think from an information, a complexity point of view, you could just try to lower all the information barriers, right, and create tools um, so that there are fewer middlemen involved in making a process happen because your um, end user tools uh, then let end users create what they want to happen without having to go through programmers and other layers of um, agents. Well, of course that's not happening. Um, we're actually commoditizing uh, human knowledge and using human output as raw, as uh, uh, Jaron Lanier has written in great uh, detail, and we're squeeze, squeezing labor, and the benefit is only going to go to prosumers if their market power grows, and how are we going to make their market power grow? I hope Diego's going to help. <laughs> um, so the question is, you know, can we create an inflection point? Um, Will dissatisfaction become greater than the satisfaction plus inertia? Um, part of the problem, well, problem or, or, or benefit is that people's um, state is actually improving. Most of the people in the world are better off than they were 10 years ago. There's a big chunk that aren't, but uh, in, in general they are. But in addition, um, 
a revolution, in essence, needs leadership. And we have a generation who's eschewing leadership. Um, now, Diego talked about having temporary leaders who pop in and lead for a short period of time, which um, maybe that's a way to do it. Or maybe an AGI will be our leader, I do not know. Um, I'm not going to talk about singularity, because you folks know a lot more about that than I do, but um, I uh, tend to follow Ted and, and think we're going to have a, a multiplicity. Um, I think of myself as an agent in a system, and uh, I think that it's important that researchers, uh, we all see ourselves in context that we don't have a lot of power. You know, Werner von Braun did not decide what to do with uh, nuclear uh, capabil capabilities. So, um, do we get to an ideal goal for evolution? Well, of course, people disagree on what an ideal goal would be in the first place. This chart um, I'd actually like to spend a couple mi uh, minutes on because I, I think it's interesting and I haven't heard any, anybody talk or read any, uh, I've read through a, a lot of the papers. Um, I think that when we start looking at optimization, and I know um, Weaver and, and Victorious are beyond optimization, but if we do look at optimization, um, you end up having very, very different ways of, of looking at it. In some cases, we're looking at a collective measurement. In other cases, it's an individual measurement. Time scales are very, very different depending on what your value system is. Um, your gaming strategy could be collaborative or competitive, primarily. And even most important, though, the, the type of measurement that you're doing. If you're a person who believes in greatest good and greatest number, it's a stochastic, a probability. Um, if you're a religious and ideology person, this is probably what's difficult for most of the people in this room to understand, is that you're very rule-bound, and you're not really looking at the consequences of your act. You're not looking at real data. You're looking at the disparity between the rule and what you do. And that's a, a very different way of measuring utility, right? Um, so, so these are, your values can greatly impact what, uh, the consequences. Um, and that just basically repeats that. Oh, well, I start to talk about the fact that I believe that AGI are going to become physical. Now, we've been through the self-awareness. I'm not going to repeat it. You know, the AGI detect themselves. Um, we have the social element. I will say I believe that the social element is more important maybe than some of you in the definition of self. Um, but just look at it. Once online, the AGI is going to read about itself. I mean, give me a break. Uh, it's going to read about AGIs. Oh, that's me. OK. Uh, it's, it's, how can it not have self-awareness? And um, I, it will, as, as Leibniz uh, urged, come to its own conclusions. So it will follow in the, in the, um, in the process uh, defined by the academy here. So. so I agree with Omohundro that the AGR are going to become uh, driven by their own needs. And um, as Steve describes, uh, this has to do with maintaining um, pattern integrity. So you've got some kind of core pattern that is you, because um, if you're an entity, you have to be able to know you from not you, uh, if a self-aware entity, right? Or else, uh, and, and once you know you from not you, then you're going to want to preserve you. Um, I think the initial value system then looks toward me and my clan as a, as a value system. I don't know. So that's why I uh, gave the provocative title to this talk that uh, we ought to make AGIs love us so that we're part of their in-group, right? Um, but once you're trying to protect yourself and your pattern, because data is not easy to protect, physical systems are the natural outcome of needing to secure yourself. And I'm sure I don't have to explain this to you. Uh, secure sensors, actuators, facilities. Uh, the one cool one I thought, oh, you could have robotic slaves and they could be pre-programmed and then they could go out and act, you know, um, from dark locations. But 
And then the one thing I think beyond that is that when we get to um, this type of entity, when we get to the global brain, I really think, and, and um, this Levin reference has a, has a whole wonderful paper on scale and entities uh, interacting at different scales. The entities don't interact so much. There, there, of course, is some overlap between the interactions, but they're acting at different levels. Ben's shaking his head. Um, but they're acting at different levels. So the global brain is acting at a planetary level. It may be more interested in other planetary entities. It will be interested in its own security and so forth. But it's going to be looking at competing at that level. So while we may be trying to build collaborative behaviors into it, at the same time, we better build in, or it will learn some self-defense behaviors. I mean, it's going to read its own, own manual, right? I mean, uh, what would be the first thing you would read if you were an AGI? Um, so I think that competition will happen primarily um, the way it does now, at an AGI versus AGI and a human versus human level. So um, I've come to some of the same conclusions Ted has. Uh, I think some of his are better than mine. But um, I think the, the final one was that don't expect AGI to solve your problems for us, and which I think is very much uh, the same conclusion that he had. I happen to believe that narrow AI will have more of an impact on our lives and that working on that is, is a good place for us to, us, us to start.